I'm pleased to be with three outstanding board savvy superintendents today. Dr. Oliver Robinson, Shenandoah Central School District, New York. Dr. Mark Schaefer, Thompson School District in Colorado. And Dr. Aaron Spence, Virginia Beach City Public Schools in Virginia. Our topic is preparing senior administrators who are what we call superintendent aspirants to build a really solid partnership with the board when they take the helm of the school district. Now, let's begin, dear panelists, by your sharing with our viewers what you see as the three or four or even five characteristics of a really close, positive and productive board superintendent partnership. Um, Oliver, why don't you lead off? Sure, Doug, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. So when I think of the question that you pose, I think about in order for a partnership to work and work effectively, um, over time, which is a key part of this over time. Um, I think certain things need to be built on certain things, such as first is honesty. Um, there needs to be a clear understanding by you and the board that all deliberations and, and conversations are grounded in that. We have to be able to be honest with each other to effectively do it. Comes with that honesty is humility. Recognize that even as, as education leaders, we don't have all the answers. Um, and as board members, their job isn't to come with a single answer. So fostering that sense of humility that, that again, um, conversations can be honest and open. A third component, I think, with that is consistency. I think as a leader, you have to be consistent. People need to know where you stand. What's, what's your purpose, right? And, and I think those things are important. Then, then the board understand you, you understand the board. So honesty, humility, consistency then leads to the fourth thing, which I think captures the essence of all those things, is a profound sense of integrity. I call it the line in the sand. There's certain things as educational leaders we should not do and or allow in terms of those things that we know will have an adverse impact on the quality of teaching and learning. And so, so those are the things I think when you come in with that true sense of conviction as a leader, grounded in a sense of honesty, driven by the fact that to be great, you must be humble at times, being consistent in your approach and your thinking and your expectations lends to an unwavering sense of integrity. Thanks, Oliver. Now, uh, our other two panelists can weigh in and tell us uh, uh, how you know a partnership between a board and a superintendent is really close and productive and effective. What are the characteristics? Gentlemen? Yeah, so I guess, um, I mean, I think uh, the key characteristic for me is there's this kind of mutual respect. So there's this sense that, hey, I understand what you're trying to accomplish and, and you understand what I'm trying to accomplish and we're able to, in really transparent ways, uh, talk about that and find some common ground. I think a key uh, characteristic, um, you know, if you have those things that Oliver's talking about, I think a key thing that will come out of that is it, it will be obvious to everybody that you're working in the same direction. And, uh, you know, to me, that's maybe the most important aspect of a really positive and productive board relationship is that all the arrows are pointing in the same direction, right? That because we're communicating clearly, because we've established this sense of like, we know where our line in the sand is, and in general, our focus is going to be on the right thing, which is always going to be what's best for kids and how do we make sure that kids are achieving at the level that we want them to achieve while having kind of all of the, the, the supports wrapped around them that they need to be successful. Um, if That we're all going in the same direction and we can clearly articulate that. And um, I think if we can do that, um, you know, our, our community will feel well served by that relationship, right? So... What happens, and we, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about some of the barriers, but what happens sometimes where some of the challenges come up is when 
you know, most people agree on where we should be going and then there's some disagreement. And then how do you, how do you work your way through that? And I think that's where you have to fall back on some of the things that Oliver was talking about. So, you know, if, if I think that um, we should really be pressing forward very strongly with an academic program and there's some people in the community who disagree with it, how do we, how do we make sure that as a, as a board and superintendent, we're very strong in our understanding of our work so that um, we can at least articulate why we're doing what we're doing and not have that be undermined out in, out in the community. Great. Mark, what would you like to add? So it's always uh, the tough. The Colorado to perspective, please. Yeah. Uh, but it's always uh, tough following um, uh, two very uh, brilliant minds. So I appreciate uh, Oliver and Aaron's uh, perspective. Um, for me, the operative word is relationships. Um, and it's really fostering and cultivating that relationship. I have seven board members and being able to differentiate those relationships are really important, but it takes time. Um, and here in education, education is about people and board members are people too. Um, and so taking that time to really get to know their passions and interests and desires as board members, um, but also having them understand me uh, as a leader and as a person, I think is huge. Um, I also recognize that, you know, I, I'm hired for my expertise uh, as a superintendent, but I also don't have to be the smartest person in the room, uh, even though sometimes I am. Uh, but uh, having that expertise is important, but I think having humility as well is equally important. And so leading um, with uh, the seven board members, um, uh, having that um, same interest and passion and, and, and goals and direction, but also having them press against my thinking. Uh, they're members of my community, seven members. Uh, some don't even have educational backgrounds, which is awesome because, you know, in education, often we see things um, um, one way, but sometimes people might have um, more creative um, lenses or views or, or, or see things that we may not even um, speculate or imagine. And so um, I think that's really important as well. Good. Thank you, gentlemen. By the way, you mentioned seven board members, Mark. Oliver, how many do you have? I have seven members as well. Seven as well. And Aaron? I have 11. 11, okay, uh, not a lot larger, but definitely larger. I think we're being joined. Hi everyone, Billy? I am so sorry. You could go ahead and kick me off, but I had a meeting I could not get out of. So I totally apologize everyone. Well, you don't Mr. have to Mr. apologize Mr. further. A favor anyway, so I'm sure he was. Uh... <laughs> I was covering for you, Talisa. It's nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now, thank you. We, we did begin recording. So I'm going to officially welcome Dr. Talisa Dixon, superintendent of the Columbus City Schools in the great state of Ohio. So now um, our panel is representing um, in the West, Colorado with uh, Mark. And then as we move um, eastward, um, let's, uh, we get to Columbus, Ohio. And then we have uh, Aaron down in the Southeast uh, in uh, Virginia and Oliver uh, in the um, great state of New York. I was going to say the Mohawk Valley, but that's not quite uh, accurate, but not too far, 100 miles away. So, uh, Talisa, we're delighted to have you join us. And we have we have talked about, in fact, we just finished talking about uh, my first question, which is the key characteristics of a really effective, a close, productive, enduring board superintendent partnership. And you're just in time to weigh in on that question. So I will turn it over to Dr. Talisa Dixon. <laughs> question one. So what was that question again? Repeat that, that question. question. That question is, um, what would you see 
as three or four, the really key characteristics of an effective, a close, positive, productive, enduring relationship between a school board and a superintendent. What would it look like? Yeah. Uh, first, I think you um, your approach to work in the spirit of trust. Uh, I think that is so important that you trust your leader. You trust um, the leader's intention. Um, and I think that's, that's paramount. You have to trust the leader. Um, and two, you have to partner with them on the vision, right? Um, we come at this work um, not with our independent visions, but we bring, uh, um, I think, a collective vision for the community, right? So we don't come to, we don't approach this job and say, hey, we're going to move to this, this, to these communities and come up with our independent visions. We really work with our board because they are representatives of the community, and we are hired to really help the community and the board realize what that vision is. So I think that um, that spirit of collaboration um, and, and trust is, is two of the important things. And um, I think the third thing that's important is that there's a, a spirit of continuing learning, right? That we don't approach this work, either the board or the superintendent, that we know everything. And that we're going to always professional. We're going to value professional development. Uh, professional learning is so important, so that the organization continues to thrive and move forward. And we bring in innovative ideas and innovative thinking to this work. Whereas it's policy reform, um, program implementation, um, and so I think those are the big three things that I think are important with the board and superintendent relationship. Great. We've taken a tour then of the relationship, generally speaking. Some of the things I heard, uh, I might use different words, but uh, uh, when you've got a really effective relationship, you do have a serious focus on students and student achievement. It's front and center. Uh, another thing I heard, Important decisions do get made um, expeditiously. The big issues get dealt with. I heard that um, you'll see a positive culture, not a lot of, uh, uh, you know, dysfunction, but the board works reasonably harmoniously with the superintendent and the administration. And uh, I think that's, those were, key themes I heard, the, and vision. You see uh, that there's unity of vision. Um, so great beginning. Let's look at the second question. What would you advise superintendent aspirants to do early on when they take the helm of a district, their first district, they were aspirants, but now they're in the uh, top spot in a district. Uh, what should they do uh, really early on to build a solid partnership with their new board? What steps should they take? Aaron, why don't uh, you take this one first? And then we'll all chime in. Yeah, so absolutely. Um, I mean, I personally for me a first really concrete step that I think you have to take is you've got to spend time with your board right so you've got to spend time with your board that's not focused on a formal agenda but time you know either in a retreat or another setting where you really can get to know each other you really can learn some things about each other that are going to be important in the relationship so I would use an example of that um, kind of talking about roles and responsibilities. And does everybody have a clear picture of what the roles and responsibility of a board is and the role and responsibility of the superintendent and how those things are going to work together to function effectively to help lead the division forward or the district forward? Um, I think that's important. I think another thing, new superintendents really have to spend probably most of their time early with their board on is really talking clearly about communication. What do we expect in terms of how we communicate with one another? 
what's your, you know, I mean, as simple as what's your favorite way for me to communicate with you, you know, so, you know, you've got people who want a phone call, they want to meet with you every week, you've got people who don't want either of those things, they just want to get your weekly update, you've got other folks who want to text with you at all hours of the night, and it's okay that it's different, um, and you understand how people prefer to have those communication channels, but of course, you also want to establish really early with everybody that there aren't going to be any surprises here. What one board member knows and hears from me, everybody's going to know and hear from me, even if the channels for that vary. And uh, I think you just have to spend a lot of time on that process. I think we all know everybody on this call is nodding because we all know where this can go wrong fast in terms of the board superintendent partnership is when the communication channels shut down and, and or, or people feel like they've been left out or surprised by something. And, and so to me, I mean, that is like right up front, like, do we know our roles and responsibilities? Do we accept those clearly? Um, and I'm not trying to say there's hard lines, you know, Doug, you and I've talked about this before. There's not always a hard line between, you know, administration and governance. There's, there's things that can blend in there. And part of talking about those roles and responsibilities, at least from my perspective, is finding out, uh, and I, I learned this honestly from, from you, is what are the, how, do, how does a board member feel fulfilled? You know, what is it that's going to help them feel fulfilled in their work as a board member? And then finding ways to, to, to give them roles and responsibilities that will allow them to really leverage their strengths and feel that way about their work. And being sure that that also doesn't encroach into micromanaging my work and that I, I need to be able to go and still lead the district and make sure that I'm, I'm implementing their vision and making sure that their policies are being followed. Um, and and uh, again, I think... Um, you know, then early on looking at the governance structure and make and making an assessment of that to see is it is it structured in such a way so that we can all do our jobs and everybody can feel like they've got a stake in the game. Okay, good beginning. Let's hear from our other panelists. So, so Doug, let me just chime in. Um, great points, Aaron. Um, and, and I would want to take it actually a step back, even before on the job. For me, those conversations were a part of the interview process. Those conversations are embedded in language in your contract. In my contract, I have what I call a no surprise clause. So in other words, within 24 hours, if there's something that on my end that would be brought to the board's attention that the board may need to be, I'm gonna bring it to their attention, right? Particular things that's gonna hit the media, things that's gonna become the chatter in the community. And, and conversely, if there are issues that the board is hearing, communicate with me. So back to Aaron's point, those clearly defining those terms of communication is so important because the worst thing that you wanna do is you get off caught, caught, caught off guard and or the board is caught off guard because then those relationships are strained and the trust um, 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 becomes doubtful, right? So, so some of the things that Talicia um, I mentioned before in terms of coming with that spirit that we have to be in a trust and relationship. So, so to me, it starts early, it starts in the contract language, it starts with the expectations, because the last thing you want to do is come on the job and then have a new, oh, well, this is what I want. Well, it kind of changes the dynamics. And with that being said, you also then know that as board members turn over from year after year, this is, has to be something that has to be repeated as a part of an annual retreat. Every year, the same topics have to come up to discuss what I call those terms of engagement, right? And, and, and all those things that Aaron said are part of that large terms of engagement, particularly being very clear that we, yes, we recognize that there's policy that the board governance focuses on, and then there's execution that the leadership focuses on. And the beauty is the blending of both. And ultimately then it's accountability for the results, right? So, so I think those things are, are early conversations, as early as feeling those things out through the interview process, and articulating as much as you can in broad sense um, as a part of your, even your contractual piece. Because at the end of this, it's going to go back to that. What do everyone understand, expect, and appreciate? A lot of wisdom there. Two more panelists. Weigh in, please. Okay, I could go next. Um, Presumably, uh, your stock is highest when you first start because you were selected uh, for the position. And so um, unless you, you know, enter your superintendency, your first superintendency on a, on a split vote or a contentious vote, um, 
it truly is a honeymoon period. Um, the board has a vested interest in your success. They want you to be select, uh, um, successful. They selected you. Um, and so uh, I'm in my first superintendency. Now I'm beginning my fifth year in my first superintendency. Um, but I did take um, a lot of time in year one, again, not only building those relationships, but but really creating um, kind of rules of engagement of how we're going to work well together. Um, part of that is, again, spending time. Um, I tend to listen more than I talk. Uh, you learn a lot by listening and by really listening to your uh, seven uh, partners, your seven board members, uh, you get to learn a lot about them. Um, but they also want to hear about you as well. And, um, you know, quite honestly, as a superintendent, you are their sole employee. Um, and I sometimes have to remind my board that I report to them and they are my seven bosses, um, but it kind of sort of stops there because they hired me to run the district. And while um, the board can certainly um, provide governance and provide um, support, um, you know, I, I, you know, I was hired to run the day-to-day -day operations of the district. And so, um, you know, and there's a nuance and a finesse to those conversations because you don't want to come off, uh, um, you know, where you're not working in partnership and you're not working arm in arm. Um, but I think creating those uh, working agreements and those norms are absolutely critical. Um, concrete steps that we took after, you know, spending a lot of time with them individually and as a group, you know, we spent our uh, a full day retreat, quite honestly, um, talking about those things and getting those things on the table. And, um, you know, what do you need um, from me um, for success? And here's what I need from you for success as well. And uh, here's what, you know, things that, you know, my colleagues talked about. Here's what communication, what I'd like communication to look like and and what do you need um, in terms of communications I mean for some uh, you know we'll see you three times a month you know we've got three meetings that's when I'd like to hear from you others um, you'll hear from me you know eight to 14 times a day um, okay um, and it's uh, and again it's that differentiation it's the relationship it's 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 my availability um, it's also uh, trust you know again um, when they trust me and I trust them uh, we get a lot done um, and, you know, we're able to move and advance um, the district forward and further. So, um, again, I think, um, like the first question, the second one really boils down to establishing those trusting relationships, um, reminding them that you're the sole employee um, of them, um, reminding them that they hired you to do a job, um, and um, also working with them in tandem and partnership on a lot of things that we were able to do. Great. Talisa, what would you like to add? You know what? I think my colleagues said it all. I think um, I just wrap it up again and say relationships, relationships, relationships. Um, it's, it's, it's key along with communication. Um, but I will just, you know, just caution new superintendents that there will be moments of crises when you have to uh, really pivot. And I think we've all experienced that working um, during a pandemic. Um, that, but that goes back to trust. When you trust the leader that you hire, you really trust that that person is going to make good decisions on behalf of the community in which they were chosen to serve. So yes, you, you know, you know, it's communication, collaboration, relationships, but there will be times where the best laid plans kind of go astray, but knowing if you trust your leader, you know, that your leader is going to, um, make the decisions as was best for the organization. You know, it's interesting. One of the changes I've seen, fairly dramatic changes in my, oh my gosh, it has been about 35 plus years uh, working with boards and uh, superintendents. Um, one of the big changes has been the lessening of distance. When I first began to work with public and nonprofit organizations like school districts. You heard a lot from chief executives, including superintendents, about the importance of maintaining role differences, the importance of not stepping on each other's toes, the importance of guarding against micromanagement and a lot of, you know, uh, don't cross the line sort of rhetoric. You heard very little about this new superintendent 
taking responsibility for relationship building. But now I hear a lot about the importance of getting to know the board. And I think on the second question, this is maybe the, the summary of all of your responses. Get close to them as early as you can. Not just as a corporate entity, a governing board, but as individuals and know them, get to know them as well as you can, as fast as you can. A sort of up close and personal approach. They are people and people can be difficult. And so if we're really gonna work effectively with them, we do have to know them as well as we can possibly know them. I never heard that 35 years ago. And I doubt that when you all were in graduate school, you didn't hear a lot about that, did you? If you even had a course in governance. Did you get a big dose of the importance of relationship building with the board? way back when? Got, you got did. A dose, got a dose of relationship building. And also, though, you're right. I think there were a lot of conversations really early in my career, for sure. A lot of the mentor superintendents that I had said, you have to make sure they know their lane. They got to stay in their lane. Stay in and, their lane, yeah. You know, and I think there's, you know, and I know we'll talk about some of the barriers and challenges. I mean, I think there is there are some places where that can go out of whack, um, you know, but of course, I think, too, there's there is some gray area. There aren't like kind of like hard lane dividers. Right. Would anyone like to add anything before we go on? I just think the role has shifted um, um, as we have pushed for more advocacy for our students in our various um, communities. And so the role of the superintendent has really shifted. Um, so you're not just managing your, your school, you really are a voice of your community on other platforms. Um, and I think because of um, that shift that we, um, I don't know if communities are becoming more cautious when they hire the leaders or, you know, board members want to make sure that um, um, superintendents are aligned with certain agendas in a sense of the community, you know, for, and it would never, I never heard of it from, from that lens before. Um, so I think, you know, our role has changed our, the, the, um, in a way that um, it really puts us at different in, in positions that we were not at seeing it before, right? So we just not the champion of the school, we're really champion of some types of some agendas where if it, you know, now is everyone is pushing for the most part, um, uh, most um, superintendents are really pushing a, a equity agenda, a community, a school-based equity agenda. How do you make sure that every kid that comes to your school community has equitable opportunities to learn? Right, so those agendas have really placed us in some communities uh, on different platforms of what those agendas are about. Right, so you know, um, I don't think we 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 did not approach this work um, from that uh, lens. We really approached this work to really be champions of um, providing equitable opportunities for our kids, uh, so that they can come back and change their communities. Um, and change their families, um, trajectory of their families. And so I think we approached it from that, but it's really evolved over the years, and especially the last 10 years, just really being something very, um, uh, very different. And as Aaron said earlier, we kind of talked about some of the challenges and barriers. I mean, I think that that can become, um, I, there, I know there are challenges, but there could be some um, uh, barriers that we face to pushing that that work in this current climate. You know, <clears throat> a thought comes to me, uh, and I've been doing some writing about this and thinking about it the last few years, that I'm seeing a, a new model, if you will, of superintendent, a school district chief executive officer, coming along uh, where it's, it's more of a hybrid position 
Whereas in the old days, uh, where is the superintendent? Well, the superintendent's head of the executive um, branch of the school district, and in fact, is the head of all the internal operations. And uh, the board's over here, the board governs it. The, uh, I see a superintendent who sees things from the perspective of a board member as well as from the executive perspective, who is, uh, in a sense, an un, uh, a board member non-voting. And by the way, that is a strong development in the nonprofit sector, not in uh, the K-12 sector, but in the nonprofit sector. A strong development has been uh, adding chief executives to the board. Now, we're not doing that in K-12 education, maybe someday it will happen. But nonetheless, I'm seeing superintendents who try to put themselves in the place of board members uh, and understand how they think, understand what motivates them, understand why they're responding the way they're responding to certain things. Not just seeing things from the perspective of uh, the administration or the uh, executive team. And uh, maybe someday, I would not be surprised, I don't think I'll be alive, but I think someday we may see superintendents as non-voting members of uh, school boards. But uh, we won't see it, at least in my lifetime, and maybe not in yours either. Who knows? Anyway, let's go on to uh, the third question. Uh, what barriers and challenges should superintendent aspirants expect to face as they build their new partnership with their first board? What should they anticipate might be some of the stumbling blocks, the uh, potholes, if you will, in the relationship building road and um why why don't um you take this mark sure thanks doc um let's say first and foremost um norms or work agreements may not align and so i may have in my mind what i see as the brilliant and awesome way forward to forge a really strong partnership um, one of collaboration and mutual respect. Um, but I have seven variables and um, we may or may not align. And interestingly, I don't get to choose those seven individuals, which by the way, change every two years um, with elections. And so um, no matter how much listening and how much relationship building, um, uh, these are individuals who, um, you know, sought a role on the Board of Education for a variety of reasons, and um, they're going to lead, um, and their leadership um, uh, looks different. And so I would say in terms of building these collaborative working uh, relationships, these um, operating norms and agreements, um, there may be malalignment or there may be times where we may not see eye to eye just philosophically or on principle just because of uh, where, how we approach things. And so um, being mindful of that and aware of that is I think really important, um, especially you know, now more than ever where things, you know, there's, a, there's a volatility right now, as we know, in, in, in leadership and in school districts. And um, a lot of that plays out in the boardroom, in the politics of the community and in the district. And uh, these seven members are members of our community. And um, while the, the role of the superintendent is apolitical and it's um, you know, helping to foster and, and, and run an award-winning district and all those pieces, um, you know, philosophical, um, beliefs and the ways we approach our worldview may be malaligned. So that I would say is one. Um, also recognizing that our board members are members in the community. 
Um, they may be parents who send uh, kids to school. They may be friends with teachers. They may be, um, they may know people. Um, they receive phone calls that you may not be aware of. Um, you know, they, they're, um, they're confidants. And so if you don't have a trust, mutual trust, you know, I, I, I certainly know that my board members speak with lots of different people and get lots of feedback. Um, I don't expect them, nor do they tell me everything. Um, I don't want to get blindsided. You know, if certainly there's an issue, um, if a principal is coming to talk to them, uh, and I'm not aware of that, uh, that hasn't happened, by the way, but that would be a concern. Um, but I, I think especially, you know, I'm in a fairly large district, but in smaller districts where it's more of a community feel and board members are certainly members of the community, maybe former employees, um, that could create um, difficulties, I think, for the relationship. Um, especially if there's not um, transparency and candor and honesty. Um, and then I guess the, the last piece I would say is board members are also not educators. Uh, not all of them are. And so the edu speak or the, you know, those other pieces that, um, you know, we kind of sleepwalk through in our decision making and our day to day operations. Um, sometimes board members are not aware of that or sometimes we're moving so quickly and making decisions a mile a minute and board members, um, may not understand or may not agree or may need more information. And so, um, you know, strong relationships, you know, I don't, I don't expect them to blindly trust every decision I make. That's not, you know, how I operate and how, you know, the board leads. Um, but, but sometimes there is an education of the education that's going on. And sometimes the superintendent needs to be educated as well um, around things that they see. And so being, you know, open to that, I think is really important. As well. Panelist. Way in on question three. So, um, Doug, again, thank you for this opportunity. Actually, I'm just going to piggyback on something that Talisa said and use an old adage and change slightly. Heavy the head that, that wears the tiara, right? Um, and 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 so when we think about our roles as 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 education leaders, as system leaders, um, to whom much is given, much is required. We have tremendous um, um, uh, power in the sense that what we do has generational impact and, and comes with that a tremendous responsibility to, to be true to the purpose. And, and so I think that what happens that one of the biggest challenge people have is, is when that purpose is questioned, where do you stand and or where do you back away? Um, and, and I think sometimes we have people who succumb and, and quite frankly, you bastardize the purpose um, for um, self-preservation or for, for occupation preservation. And, and that's when we lose the race in terms of, of ensuring that we're doing what's right and righteous for our kids. Um, and so for me, I call that a, a commitment of conviction. In other words, we're not doing it because it's convenient. We're not even doing it because it's popular for that matter. We're doing it because it's the right things to do. And, and we stand firm to that. And I think over time, people see that, 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 that stands out, right? And so, so, so I think one of the challenges, especially now, where um, certainly, um, I think in certainly recent history, we have these, these gaping ideological perspectives that have penetrated the fabric of schools, where schools are now becoming the playground for, for, for gaping politics and gaping perspectives. And I think that's where, as, as, as an aspirant superintendent, we have to be that person that says schools are supposed to be sacred, place for, sacred places for learning. We have to be those rocks within our communities. We have to be those pillar in that time of storm, so to speak, right? So, so when people think about our school system, they see that it's a leader who truly, as Aaron articulated earlier, has the fundamental best interests of all kids in mind. And so, so that's a challenge, but that's also the purpose of why we're in these positions. And I think that, that if, if any conversation needs to happen, there needs to be a conversation with even us as educational leaders in terms of how do we bring that to the table every time, recognizing that there will be differences in opinions and even disagreements with board members. However, our job is not to personalize it. Our job is to actualize the mission and the visions of our respective school districts. So, so, so to me, that's gonna be, that's the difference. And, and, and just to put my, from my vantage point, this is my 21st year as a school superintendent. And every year, because we always have one or potential one or two or three new board members, 
every year this starts over. This, this, this again, keen focus on establishing those fundamental tenets that drive our work. Every year it starts over. And I think as an aspirant, you have to gear up for that. You have to recognize that you're never on autopilot. Every year mm. you bring the energy, you bring the sense of urgency, you bring the vision, you bring the direction. And you have to be politically savvy enough to get people to understand and appreciate it and see themselves in the larger picture that we're all trying to paint for the betterment of our students. Well said. Any other who hasn't weighed in? Let's hear from you. I think we dropped the mic on that last comment. <laughs> I, you know, I can just drop the mic. Um, I think, you know, what you said, we, you know, it's not personalized, but, you know, we, we actualize it. I think that was uh, so important. Um, um, the other piece you said, we have to be politically savvy, right? I, I think that's where, um, a that's a big challenge, right? Because you can be so, um, so driven, mission driven, um, but if you don't really understand the players, all the work that you've done could be for nothing. Um, right. And so, and, and that is the, you know, they, they, they don't teach you that in super, in school, right? You, you, but you have to really have a board to help guide you through, through those terrains. I think that's what a good board president does, a board chair can really tell you where the landmines on who are you know who you need to talk to who you, you know who you need to be friends with those are challenges because it prevents you from getting that big that work done that you know is needed for your on behalf of your students that you serve um and i think there needs to be more work around that um because we come, you know, again, we come to this work. I mean, I'm finishing up my eighth year as superintendent, you know, and here's someone say, I have 20, like 21 years in this. I, he already knows the landmines, right? He knows how to, but some of us who are still kind of, you know, you know, you know, novice in this, in this work, you still landing on landmines and you'd like oh my that's a landmine there's another landmine you know and you're so busy trying to get the work done you know you have all these aspirations all these goals and your mission and you're driven and oh my gosh all this work you spent two years on you didn't know that you should have talked to <laughs> this person over here right and it just really prevents and people don't understand that Right. They just want to see that, um, it, you know, the future that you're building for the kids is going to be brighter. Um, but I think those are some challenges and barriers that can be overcome. But somehow those have to be kind of up front and center so that we can really move the work forward. Yeah, you know, I agree with everything everybody has said. And I, I would I would to take it down to a, a, a bit more of a kind of on the ground pragmatic level in terms of what a bunch of folks are dealing with. My, I, I have dealt with this. I'm certain folks here have dealt with this and, and certainly aspirants need to be aware of it. Um, it would be nice if your board was kind of universally helping you along and and patting you on the back and showing you the landmines and, and cooperating and communicating with you. Um, but I think a challenge and a barrier to the pot, you know, the, the specific question about, about the partnership, um, you know, it certainly can be, we have to own some of it. I have to own, you know, when I make mistakes, but we have people on our boards with specific agendas and we have people on our boards who will go rogue. Um, who, you know, I, I have been in a situation where I have had a board member who refused to communicate with me. It just, it wasn't, you know, there wasn't a, a channel of communication open. And, it's very difficult in that environment to be able to kind of get all the arrows as I started off with this conversation, like you want all the arrows pointing in the same direction. You want everybody working in the same direction. And when you're working with people who are specifically not working in the same direction and they're intentionally not working in the same direction, I think it's really important for people who are coming into this to be aware that that might happen. And you have to gird yourself for that. And you have to, you have to prepare yourself to do what Oliver and Talisa are both talking about, which is to keep focused on what's right, 
manage and, and interact and communicate with the people that you know want to go forward with that work and build your coalition uh, so that you can continue to do what's right for children because there will be people who will intentionally come in and try to disrupt, who, who do have an agenda. You know, Oliver talked about who will push back against an equity conversation, who will say, we don't want to talk about equity in our schools. That doesn't feel right to us. And, you know, we have to be prepared to build a coalition around that to say, what? Well, let's talk about what we mean by equity and why it matters and why it's so important for all children that we're focused on their success. And don't we want all children to feel included and belonging in our in our classrooms and to feel like the adults love them and want the best for them? And, you know, you have to build build around that. But I think it's important that uh, folks realize, you know, even if, because um, I've seen this too, if the forward facing view, you know, if the Tuesday night on the TV view of the board is one that's coalesced, that oftentimes behind the scene, that's not the case. And and so you you have to kind of gird yourself to be able to deal with some of the challenging personalities and agendas and be prepared to stand on your core values as you move as you move the work forward. Well, dear panelists, before we move to the last question, just a couple of thoughts uh, I want to share. Uh, one barrier we didn't talk about that I've seen, uh, new superintendents encounter. And many don't anticipate it, is they've been hired by a board that might look fairly harmonious and effective at first blush anyway, but they might be hired by a board that's seriously underdeveloped, that turns out to uh, need major development, um, that uh, whether it's uh, an unclear role, whether it's a structure that needs tweaking, whether it's processes for engaging and things like budgeting and so on, uh, this will turn out to be a major pothole for the new superintendent that they should anticipate. I might have a board that's not capable of governing at a high level. What can I do about that? Well, of course, that's no, we don't have time today to get into that, but that might be a good follow-up topic uh, for another uh, uh, video interview is what do I do if I encounter a board that's frankly so underdeveloped, it turns out to be pretty dysfunctional. One other thought, we talked a lot about very appropriately about relationship building as uh, uh, perhaps the preeminent challenge for the new superintendents, get to know these these people who have so much power and influence over the, the district and the superintendent's professional life. Um, we didn't say anything about the board president or board chair uh, and the opportunity to turn that person into an ally and a close partner. Once again, a subject that could take up a whole video uh, that we don't have time to get into. But uh, I think it is fair to say that, uh, would you all agree with me that we'd counsel superintendent aspirants to think about, gee, how would I turn <laughs> the board president I, uh, I'm now working with into a real ally, uh, uh, not just one of the board members, but someone who could be, who could back me up, who could be a real partner, and maybe help become, be a mentor to me. Not always possible, of course. You don't choose the board president, you inherit the board president when you come on board. But anyway, um, well, we've come to the last question. You'll all be happy to know because I know you've got more important things to do uh, than this panel. Uh, and as educators, you will love this question since it's about curriculum development. If you were putting together a half day or even a full day workshop for superintendent aspirants on 
how they would should go about developing uh, uh, an effective, uh, enduring, productive, close partnership with their board. Uh, what topics should be covered in that half day or even perhaps full day workshop? Uh, what are the major uh, pieces of the uh, curriculum for that day? And Talisa, why don't you be our laid off here? Hmm, that's a good question. <laughs> I think it goes back to um, the, the very first question. So this, um, uh, I, I think meeting and, and, and having uh, that opportunity with your board at first uh, professional development, I'm assuming the first professional development meeting with your board, what should that, the content of that meeting be, um, I think goes back to um, who we are, knowing who you are as a person um, and just establishing that. I think those, I, I, I love doing icebreakers. Some of my board members do not like doing icebreakers, but I think icebreakers are good if, if they're structured appropriately that you're learning something new about your team members. Um, and then how do you, how, why is this work important? Find out what's important to them. Um, and then once you find out what's important to them, I mean, it goes back to their communication. How do you communicate? So I think communication styles is good. Uh, we're reading a book now called In Taking Flight. Um, just a little short book about, you know, uh, so it's, it's just like, how do we approach this work, who we are? Um, I just think that's important. And then what's the real, what's the work? What is the work that we have to do, right? And that may comes with some data. You know, you're looking at your student outcomes. Um, is it a facilities project, whatever. But, you know, who we are, you know, why is this work important? Um, how do we communicate with one another? And then what are the heavy lifts? I, I think that is so important that you want to know um, the first meeting. You should know a little bit about it when you're interviewing, when you take these jobs, because as the board is interviewing you, you should be interviewing the board. Um, but I think that first meeting, you're really kind of memorializing um, what's the work ahead and how you approach that work. Because in the absence of that, you were missed. And I've been in a situation where you kind of miss part of it because you're so eager to do the work and be the champion for the um for your school districts and sometimes you miss just those little small details um that i think is important to capture thank you you know talisa raised something we hadn't talked about and i made a little note uh, we talked a lot about relationship building but i think it's uh know thyself is a critical part of relationship building uh, Understand your own emotional makeup. Understand what are your hot buttons. Uh, uh, if if you're a relatively introverted, introverted person, and uh, you see a fair number of introverts in in education, um, well, that's going to make your relationship building job more difficult because you're not instinctively good at it. So you may have to be conscious about <laughs> um, building relationships. It won't necessarily come naturally. And so that, uh, it's very interesting. That has not come up up to now, and, and that's an important issue. Well, my friends, weigh in on this um, if fourth I can, and final question. Yeah, if I could go next, because I'm going to unfortunately have to um, log off. So um, I um, agreed strongly with uh, what Talisa shared. and. Um, also, I, uh, early on, I love to channel my uh, student council advisor. I was, uh, so I love to, you know, kind of laugh and engage in things that uh, make them uh, a little uncomfortable, but still in good fun. But um, being able to laugh together and taking them a little bit out of their comfort zone, um, 
play is really uh, important too. So um, as appropriate, and <laughs> again, a little bit of risk taking, but again, like the new kid card and, you know, assuming that you got it out of 7-0 vote, uh, it, it worked okay. Um, the two things, the two other topics that I uh, focused on, um, legal, law, um, we brought in our, you know, attorney and um, uh, really just review. A lot of uh, a lot of newbies on, on school boards, people that are not used to kind of what the legal ramifications are and, and the kind of the do's and don'ts and, and guardrails. And so um, that professional development we did early on um, and was helpful to really talk about. And the other thing um, is we did a book study uh, and Doug, I'm gonna give you, uh, <laughs> so we did this book study. <laughs> so, oh, I um, love that book. I love it. it. it is that Thank you, too, Mark. But, uh, Thank so, you, Mark, uh, for holding that up. So our, uh, our board, they loved it. And so we jigsawed the book and we talked about it and uh, gave us a lot of topics. One thing that I've been very fortunate about in, in um, all of my boards so far is they, they do love and thrive on professional development um, and taking the lead and, and uh, in their own growth and development. And that's exciting to me. Again, as an, I'm an educator at heart. And if, if they, um, I love to foster, uh, you know, this, this notion of continuous improvement and love of learning. And so the board just wants to get better and I can work with that and, and we can work with that. And so um, quite honestly, the topics in the book, um, and we went off script a little bit. I mean, it's, it's, we're not, it's not dogma, you know, we, we certainly can uh, be our own board, but gave us a lot of topics uh, to engage with. And, I, and that, that was super helpful as well. Good, thank you. Uh, any think, other uh, thoughts? Well, I, um, I think just, you know, quickly for me, I, I would really do some work with boards on polarity management. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, uh, a lot of board members come on and they're quite surprised at the amount of polarity that they have to deal with. You know, there's sort of differing perspectives that they get from different members of the community. And a lot of folks don't know how to reconcile that. You know, it can be really difficult. You know, it's, I kind of talk about, you know, there's lighthouse boards and then there's, you know, salt marsh boards, you know, and, and you know, salt marsh boards just kind of bend whichever way the wind's blowing. And, and you never know as a leader which direction they're coming at you because whatever they heard was the thing that they're interested in. And if you're a lighthouse board, you, you have a kind of core set of values that drive your thinking. And polarity management is all about being able to be responsive to different ways of thinking, uh, different perspectives on issues without getting away from your core values. And so I, I, would, I would think one of the things we'd wanna spend a lot of time with the boards on is, um, and as new superintendents really building our own skill set around is polarity management and really being able to surface the pros of different perspectives and understand the negatives and try to keep everything living in the pros so that multiple perspectives can help inform our thinking and not be dismissed. And, and just Other one, thoughts? Yeah, just one comment that um, great term, Aaron, I appreciate you, you sharing that. Um, I, I'll be using that concept um, because I'm dealing with exactly with that now with three new board members out of seven. Um, and so, so the second, the piece I would like to add to that is that, you know, I start off with the, from the notion of we must be partners in progress. And, and that partnership, recognizing that, that different people bring different things to add value to the total conversation, to the total work. And, and that partnership is also premised in the notion that we're bringing things that are positive to the table. Um, and, and if something negative, we have those discussions to, to figure out how do we take advantage of, change those, situate those challenges and the opportunities, right? And, and it's easier said than done. And I think a lot of that comes with, and certainly as a new superintendent, you may not have the confidence to have those conversations because in many cases, you may not even have the know-how about some of the things that you want to do to have the confidence to have the conversation. Um, and so that's why I think a big part of this then has to go with conversation around goal setting. You know, Talisha talked about what's our purpose. Aaron just alluded to the polarity management. You know, what are the goals of the organization? What are the goals of the school districts? What are we about as a learning community? And so in, our, in my district, we talk about things like engagement, innovation, global competence, those core values that drive our work. And so we have those conversations so the people understand that, that the values that drive the perspective of the board as policymakers are the same values that drive my role as systems leader. And, and so, so once we have that, that common understanding, you know, the what then is no longer negotiable. 
yeah, we can now have some discussion about how we best do it. And so I think I think part of that goal is that it's just not about putting fancy words on paper. It's making sure, one, that the words that we do put on paper um, focus on meeting the needs of all kids today, tomorrow, and otherwise. And, and two, it also speaks to that, that notion of how can we be repeatable and sustainable as a system? That, 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 that consistency for kids and experiences that they're encountering has to be um, um, centered to that piece of it. So, so to me, that conversation around goal setting is important. Um, and even from a very practical lens, uh, my contract is tied directly to our district goals. And so I say to the board that you guys can have all kinds of fan wonderful ideas. However, the reality of it is we're focused on doing those goals that we are committed to focus on. And, and when is the right time and appropriate time for us to have those conversations is how do we unpack in terms of, okay, we have broad goal areas. Then we have some, some, some key essential objectives that we want to achieve each year to, again, bring those goals to full realization. And so, so I think those are a big part of the conversation with a particular new leader who's also trying to understand the, the proverbial lay of the land and where the landmines are, and new board members who have certain assumptions about what their roles are. Which then goes to the last piece I want to offer, um, share is that conversation around what's the organizational structure. There's so many people who don't understand the complexity of school districts. So, so even laying out the organizational leadership, organizational chart, and trying to lay the district out in a way that's manageable so people can see how all those different chunks work together in concert for our students. And so, so I think some conversations around that so people understand that if you make a decision A, it's going to have a ripple effect. And we need to understand the ripple effect before we even make that decision. So I think conversations, same time we have a conversation around goals, we also have a conversation understanding the structure and the complexity of the organization because all those things then lend to us truly being partners in progress. Well, we have come to the moment of, almost come to the moment of uh, parting uh, today. Uh, you know, one thing that uh, I think overarching um, piece of advice I would give in a, to superintendent aspirants and other CEO aspirants in different public and nonprofit um, areas is if you're going to build a partnership with the board, which is our, our subject today, how to go about doing that, you've got to think of governance as a, as a superintendent. As, as your business, as an area where you are accountable. It's not just the boards. One thing I learned myself in my work is superintendents have tremendous influence over how well the board functions, how capable the board is. Indeed, boards are not self-developing. If they develop into more effective governing bodies, it's because a superintendent who knows governance inside out spearheads board development. So one thing we need, I think, we need to teach CEO or superintendent aspirants is uh, what the business of governance is. <laughs> what are the nuts and bolts aspects of this thing we call governing? What does it mean? And how do you develop a board? How do you take a dysfunctional board and turn it into uh, a more cohesive, a more productive board? And no board's going to do that itself. It's going to have to be the superintendent who spearheads it. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion. We've um, taken as much time as we can. With, uh, very, very busy people. I want to thank you so much 
dear panelists for uh, dedicating this much time uh, to the subject of preparing superintendent aspirants to take the helm and particularly to build a productive, uh, positive relationship with their new board. Uh, this is a subject that deserves other uh, video programs, but uh, we made a good start today. Thank you so much uh, for your thoughtful uh, commentary, and I want to wish you a very pleasant evening. Take care. Thank you, Doug. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron, Talisa, thank you very much. Thank you. You too. Thanks to both of you. Bye-bye.